Okay, so it's a, it's a pleasure to have uh, Jasper from uh, IOP, and uh, he's going to tell us about the non-Hermitian split skin effect, which, as I understand, is unpublished work that will will be out soon. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, is that yet? All right, so thanks, Jay, for inviting me. It's really nice to be here and see you all. Um, so actually, the work I will tell you about today is uh, partly published and partly not published. Oh, wait, I'm that camera. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, it's uh, the first part I'm going to tell you about is uh, oh, whoops, is already published. There, there. And so it's this work on the uh, the archive of identifiers here. It's published in PDS last year, uh, and this was spurred together with Amanya, Martin, Quentin, and myself. Uh, and so then uh, is everybody else? Yeah, we haven't full screen yet. Yeah. Uh, uh, your slides were on and then now they're off. Oh, that's not good. Sorry, let me try to get them back on then. What happened? Uh, um, one second. If, if you need a third computer, let me know. Oh, that's the annoying thing that now I want to screen. <laughs> Here we go. Now you can see it again, right? Yeah, but not in full screen. Yeah, uh, now we can. Now we can. See the mouse also? Uh, yes. I'll just use that as a pointer and do away with the fancy stuff. All right, so I'm going to tell you about this thing that was published on the archive and also some more recent work, which we did recently with uh, the same people and also these two um, master students, uh, all at Uva. All right. Um, so to start with, let me uh, introduce topology and the bulk edge correspondence, uh, since I don't know uh, exactly where everyone is in terms of background. So I'll, uh, I'll just make a very general introduction and then get to, uh, to our new results. So just to keep things very general in the beginning, right? Uh, if we talk about topology, there are many ways to talk about it. And one of them is to think about topology in mathematics. So in mathematics, topology is simply defined as sort of the, the, the study of things that are not equivalent. So you divide things into classes which cannot be deformed into one another. For example, a sphere is not a donut. And, and it is not because you cannot, if you imagine that the sphere is made out of clay or something, you cannot deform it smoothly into a donut. Uh, of course, in that description, it's very important to define what smoothly means. So smoothly deforming objects of clay now means that you don't take your finger and penetrate violently uh, the clay right, and make a hole. So without making holes, you cannot go from a sphere to a donut, and that makes them topologically distinct. Now, this is a uh, very general idea, and you can do all sorts of fancy mathematics, defining things or yeah, defining topological invariants like the number of holes, which can be used to, to separate things into different topological classes. Um, but you can also apply these ideas to physics, right? And so to go straight to materials physics. Uh, we can use the same ideas to say that the thing on the left is in a different topological class than the thing on the right. Uh, I mean, you might not see it from this picture, but actually the thing on the left is called an insulator and the thing on the right is called a topological insulator. Um, now, there's clearly no holes in this. So it, it's not the same thing as in the mathematical definition that you can deform the thing on the left to the thing on the right without making holes. Uh, neither have holes, but they have another property which stops you from deforming one into the other. Uh, and actually, this time, it has to do with physical properties, things that you can measure. So a topological insulator, uh, I think all of you already know, but anyway, I define it in my own way, uh, is something that is almost insulating, but actually not quite. Uh, and the way that we sort of see this not quite is if you look in more detail, here is a, uh, a topological insulator that's actually made not out of quantum materials, but uh, out of, can you see the dots here? Yeah, there's black dots inside the, the sh dark gray area. Yes. Yeah. So this is actually uh, like an, uh, uh, um, what's the best way to think about it? it? It's like an optical lattice, right? So you, these are actually microscopic elements that you can send light through. Uh, and again, here on the left, there's an insulator for light. And then on the right, there's the topological insulator. And the way that you see the difference is that if you pump light into the material, so you shine a laser on the uh, on the corner here. Ah, what happened now? Uh, 
did you did you shine light on the material? Yeah, sorry, there it is. Good. So if you shine light here, right, then you see it. It doesn't do anything. It, it propagates for a little bit and then disappears. Uh, but if you shine it on the topological insulator, oh, and it disappears because this thing is insulating, right? So there's no way for the light to propagate through the material. But if you do it on the topological insulator, you shine the same light here. It actually goes around all the way around the edge until you take it out on the other end. Uh, so there is an, uh, an extra state in this topological insulator. It's insulating on the inside, but conducting on the outside. And this is the way that you actually see topology appear in physical materials. Uh, but to connect it back to mathematics, there is also a mathematical quantity that is different between insulators and topological insulators. And actually, the first time that we noticed this in physics was in 1980, when uh, Klaus von Klitzing, he's on the left bottom here, uh, did some experiments on, uh, on thin pieces of two-dimensional metals. And he found out that if you put them in really high magnetic fields, then they're resistivity or conductivity becomes quantized and quantized in very particular steps. Uh, so they, they become exact uh, integer multiples of h over e squared. Uh, actually, a couple of years later, these quantum quantum hole systems were used as the definition of h and e in, in the SI system. Um, and the way that we understood this actually was very quickly it also came the, the mathematical or, or theoretical explanation of this, first by Thales and co-workers as two years later in 1982. And what he showed is that there's some quantity in this material, which you can think of, well, it is the very connection for those who know, uh, but you can think of it as just the local phase of the wave function if you don't know what a very connection is. Uh, and what you can see is that in a normal insulator, this, this vector field or phase field is sort of smooth, right? There's nothing much happening in it. But in a topological insulator, there is actually a vortex in it. So there is a place where this direction is not defined anymore, and around it, the, the vector field circulates. So this vortex you can think of exactly like the hole in, uh, in the donut, right? So you cannot deform the left vector field into the right without making a hole. And if you say that making such a hole is like a not smooth thing, you need to do something violent in order to create a vortex like that. And these two are topologically distinct. And so there's, there's a topological number, the number of vortices that separates these two states. All right. Now, the nice thing about topology then, or which makes topology interesting in physics, is that you can now make a relation. So these number of vortices that you find inside the middle of the material, right, in the bulk, the part where it's insulating, actually is equal to the number of ways that you can conduct things along the edge of the material. So for these topological insulators or topological materials in general, there is a bulk edge correspondence. You can calculate some mathematical quantity in the bulk in, in a model without any edges. Right? I can even actually to calculate these number of vortices, I have to use periodic boundary conditions so that you look at a system without any edges at all. And then you calculate the quantity, which tells you what happens if you do make edges into the system. So if I change the boundary condition. Now that, that's kind of surprising, but that is how, how you see the effects of topology in, uh, in topological materials. And the nice thing is this is a completely emergent phenomenon, hence the you know, presentation here in the deep seminar. Uh, and of course it's emergent because in order to create these edge channels, you cannot just do something at the edge. Of course, you can take an insulator and uh, put the metal covering on it and then you get the you know, conducting edge. But that's not fair. Here the conducting edge really comes from the material itself and it emerges as the bulk property. You only get this out of the bulk material and you can see immediately here why, right? Because the presence of these edge channels is determined by the number of vortices in the bulk of the material. So topology in this sense really is an emergent phenomenon. Okay, so so far the introduction, right? Uh, I guess most of you already knew most of those things. So uh, let, let's move on to uh, uh, some of our more recent work. So the first thing I want to tell you about is uh, non-Hermitian topology, so a little bit more general than the things we just discussed, and the observation of the bulk edge correspondence there. So first, to introduce non-Hermitian. So what, what non-Hermitian means in this context is really just that I'm looking at open systems. So systems that are driven, that have some pump in it, which sort of puts energy into the system, or leaky, which means that energy can also go out of the system. So then if you think in terms of uh, Schrodinger's equation, right, if, you, if you have an energy eigenstate or a state with some energy, it usually, uh, according to Schrodinger's equation, it evolves by, by having a time-dependent phase here. Um, 
Actually, you don't even have to use nor or Schrodinger's equation. Actually, any wave equation, right? If you have a, a normal mode here, it's, it evolves by having some uh, uh, some phase added onto the mode. Um, but now, if you have a driven system or a leaky system, uh, then this energy is not conserved anymore. And the way that you see this is that this frequency or energy in quantum systems becomes complex. And you can immediately see that that helps, right? If this is a real number, then this is just changing the phase of the wave. If it's a complex number, then the imaginary part of it actually changes the amplitude of the wave. So it causes dissipation or amplification. So energy in non Hermitian system is no longer real, it's complex. Uh, but then in 2018, here, uh, Shen, Shen, Zen, and Fu together uh, noticed that actually just the fact that the energy is complex allows you to make a different type of topology than the things you can do in Hermitian systems. So remember, in our mission systems, we have this vortex in, in the buried phase, which is a topological quantity, because you cannot remove it easily. Uh, but this buried phase is a property of the functions, right, of the, the shapes of the waves, the wave functions, really. Uh, but now, in non hermitian systems, the energy, which before was just a number, actually also has a shape, right? It becomes a phase or a vector in the complex energy plane. So if you have two bands with different complex energies, uh, then they can now rotate around one another, wind. So for example, here as a function of some parameter, which happens to be momentum in a one-dimensional system, but that doesn't matter. If there's some parameter in your system, and as a function of that parameter, you can make two energies wind in the complex space and then come back to each other. Uh, now, if you do this, then you can imagine, right, that there's no smooth transformation that allows you to unwind these energies, where smooth just means that you cannot make these lines cross each other. Um, so no degeneracies. And the nice thing about this is this is a, a, a winding number, a topological quantity, something that you cannot smoothly change, that does not depend on the actual wave functions, but only on the energies. So whereas this thing is, is a, what's called the Chern number officially, right? It's defined in Hermitian systems in two dimensions. You can define similar things also in one or three dimensions. Uh, but this non-Hermitian thing can actually define, be defined in any dimension. It's just the winding number of eigenvalue as a function of some parameter. Uh, so this, this idea in 2018 was completely new. So this is a new type of topology, which maybe gives rise to new topological phases, topological insulators. Uh, and, and the question is, how do we realize these things? Right? Just the fact that this is possible in principle doesn't mean that I can actually implement it in any real system. And actually, it's, it's rather hard to implement this in quantum materials, like the materials where we found the quantum Hall effect in the first place. And the reason it's so hard um, is that it's precisely because this Hamiltonian is non-Hermitian. So it means that you need to control how much energy goes into your system or goes out of the system, and you need to control where that energy goes in and out. So for quantum materials, that is super hard. Right? Because the way to put energy into materials is usually to shine lasers on it or apply magnetic fields or things like that. But to do that on one specific atom and control what goes in and out is super hard, almost impossible. So actually, in this case, for non hermitian systems, quantum materials are not the best place to look for this new topology. Luckily, we don't have to. Uh, because the same kind of concepts also apply perfectly well to classical systems. And actually, there's a very famous mapping between quantum models and classical models that works sometimes. It works for many systems. Uh, it was developed for one-dimensional systems. So you might have seen it before, right? The, the quantum model that we were thinking about was the SSH model. And so this is a one-dimensional model where electrons hop along a chain of atoms. And there's like strong coupling between two of the atoms and weaker along the other. And this one-dimensional chain has a topological phase. So it can be either an insulator or a topological insulator. And now, if you look at the Hamiltonian that describes this thing, you can mathematically map it onto the dynamical matrix describing another classical system. So these two matrices, right? You have the Hamiltonian matrix on the quantum side and a dynamical matrix on the classical side. These two matrices are the same, or at least can be mapped onto each other. And then the classical system that you map it onto is one where you have balls connected by springs. And these balls are also connected to rigid rods that are uh, nailed into the wall. Right? So they can rotate around this nail if you want. But as they are rotating, of course, these springs start to stretch and compress. 
So this thing has wave-like excitations in it. Uh, this quantum system has wave functions, and the wave functions of the quantum system map onto the wave-like excitations of this chain. So this mapping was worked out by Kaylin Lubensky in 2014, and has actually become quite famous. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, by the way, this Kaylin Lubensky chain and this, uh, the way that this is done, maybe Google it. And then also Google Vitelli and Lego, and he will give you a, a very nice presentation of where he made this chain out of pieces of Lego, uh, showing you the waves in it and, and even non-linear non excitations of it. Really nice. You should look at the YouTube video. Um, so anyway, so there is a direct map here from some quantum systems to some classical systems. So you might hope that these non-Hermitian phases you can also realize in classical systems. Of course, this system, as we have it here, is just Hermitian. It's exactly the SSH model. Sorry, yes, but just, just one quick yeah. question. So, so there is no observation so far of non-Hermitian topology in quantum systems? Uh, that depends on exactly what you mean with non-Hermitian topology. There is an observation of topological insulators, normal topological insulators, that have then been made non-Hermitian. So you can realize these in open systems quite easily, right? By just putting them in some environments and they can lose energy. But, but that is not really non-emission topology. That is the same turn number that we already had in emission systems. Okay. So it's really non-hermission topological invariance, the binding number of energies, that has not been seen in quantum materials yet. Okay. Okay. And actually it will be really hard to realize at all. Um a, a question, please. So like in, in the quantum case, like uh, is there like what what sort of restrictions would one have with like the, the open system environment that would lead to this sort of like uh, non-Hermitian uh, uh, effects uh, coming up? Uh, it, it becomes non-Hermitian as soon as the system is open. Yeah. Or as soon as you drive it. Now, then of course it depends on, on the Hamiltonian that you have, whether or not that will also make the energy wide. But that's the much more, you have to look case by case what happens and look for models with a topological phase transition, just like you would in the Hermitian case. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so we need to make this uh, this chain non-Hermitian. And actually that's quite easy to do. So in, in terms of the SSH chain, what it means is you have hopping along this bond. And now I just make this hopping directional. So hopping to the left is comes with a different probability than hopping to the right. And, and the same for the other bond. And if you do that, you get the Hamiltonian that looks like this. And you can immediately see that this thing is not Hermitian. Right, so this, the, the entry here on the bottom left is not the complex point because it's the entry here on the top right. So this is a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. But since it is based on the SSH chain, I can still do the, the, the map and map it onto a classical system. And so this classical system looks like this. So there are, again, like rigid rods with balls that they can rotate, connected by springs. But now these springs have to be very special. So these are springs that have two spring constants. One spring constant for how much force it applies from the left to the right, and another spring constant for how much force it applies from the right to the left. So naturally, that is not something that you really encounter in nature. Right? Springs always have one spring constant, not two. But you can make them effectively by putting a little motor in the spring and just measuring who is pushing, the left or the right, and then adding a little bit of force uh, to the spring. And so you can literally do this. So Quentin, uh, who's also here, did this in the lab. You can see here a thumb view of exactly this system. The red bits are the red rods. The blue bits are actually springs. So these are normal springs. And then these black uh, things on the bottom are little robots. And the robots are programmed to measure the, uh, the distance between these two rods and then apply an extra force or an extra torque to the rod, depending on uh, which one goes with. So effectively, with that extra torque added in, this spring gets two spring constants. All right. And the nice thing is, so with this system, oh, sorry, I should go back for a second. So with this Hamiltonian, right, mapped onto this classical system, which is still the same system, you can then go and explore the phase diagram and see if there are any non-Hermitian topological phases. And it turns out, of course, we chose the system so that it actually does have a, a trivial and a non-trivial topological phase. So there are some parameters here. The ratio A to B tells you something about the length of the rods, the, uh, the angles that they make. And this non-reciprocity, epsilon on the left, tells you something about how much torque the motor is applied. And by tuning these two, you can either have like trivial non-emission topology, which is just like any normal system, 
or if you drive up the driving, it becomes uh, non-trivial yeah, non non-emission technology. So binding of eigenvalues. So exactly the new can, can you just say what you mean, trivial non-emission topology? What is yeah, it? So, so I mean, if you look at the eigenvalues, they do not wind around one another. Okay. So actually, but, I've drawn it here. So uh, this is, uh, we have to look at it for a second. So the, the, the sort of horizontal plane here is the imaginary energy plane. Uh, this model here, because it's a two by two matrix, oh, sorry, it's a two by two matrix, right? Uh, so it has two eigenmodes. And if you look at the energies of these eigenmodes, they, they are here as a function of k momentum, they, they do something. And, and this thing on the top is just a projection of this line onto a single plane. So you can see what they're doing. So what they do as a function of k is just rotate, but they rotate around themselves, not around each other. So there's no, no mutual winding of any kind. Then if you, if you change some parameters and you come to this point here, exactly on this line, there is an exceptional point. Uh, wait a minute, did I do something wrong? Uh, yeah, we cannot see your pointer anymore. No, sorry. Um, here it is. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry. So if you go through this line and go into the, the, the pink uh, area, then actually these two circles come closer and closer together. And at some point they combine and then these two values start winding around each other. Right? So here you see in this pink phase, there's really a helix. And there is this sort of topological winding of eigenvalues, which has nothing to do with the modes themselves, but just with their energies. So this is this purely non-emission thing that we were talking about. And then if you push even further, you get into a different phase where they actually disconnect in a different way than before. Uh, but this is again not binding. Okay. Then you can go further and you can take a look at what happens to the, the waves, the modes in these phases. And what you see is that here, where there is no winding, actually there is a, uh, a zero energy mode. And if you look at what it looks like in real space, so this is a uh, real space coordinate, so position, then you see it's, it's amplified towards one direction. So this is a localized mode, which lives purely on the right side of the system. Then as I tune the, the, you know, the force on my motors, and I go through this phase transition, this mode actually relocates to the left side. So going through this phase transition, you see something happen to the edge modes. There was an edge mode on the right, that's also what this R means, and it goes towards the left. And if you go towards this or through the second transition, it goes back to the right. So what we find is actually that there is a bulk edge correspondence here. Right? There is something I defined in the bulk, namely the binding number of these energies, which predicts which edge my uh, topological modes are localized at. And the switching of the, of the localized mode from right to left happens precisely at this line where also the bulk winding number changes. So this is, a, if you want, a non-Hermitian bulk boundary correspondence. And the nice thing is, uh, because we designed this in terms of a, a real material, you can actually see it. Uh, can I play it? Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, there it is. So you see this is weak. Uh, driving. So this is basically in the, in the normal phase. And you see if you excite uh, the little rotors, then uh, what is it? The thing on the left moves a lot and the thing on the right does not. Right? But then if I uh, have strong driving, can I play it again? Uh, can I? Uh, there it is. It should be playing now. Yeah. Then you see now all of a sudden this thing moves a lot and this one doesn't. So the localization of this mode has changed uh, just by changing the non-reciprocal driving. So we've moved it through this phase transition. And you see precisely these two modes. First it was localized on the left and now it's localized on the right. Okay. So the conclusion then of part one is that what we, what we can do is actually observe in a real experiment on a classical metamaterial non-hermitian topology, which is truly non-hermitian, right? It's made out of winding eigenvalues, not out of a Chern number. And we showed that it has a bulk edge correspondence. So this was exactly what we showed in the PNAS paper. You can look up the details there. Can I ask you a quick question? Sorry. 
uh, in the diagram you showed in which you have these areas of trivial non Hermitian topology. So, so how do you characterize those phases? Yeah, so I think um, that's really bad name. Sorry, I took this picture out of the paper where we, we called it this to agree with previous literature. Okay. Uh, yeah, I really don't like the name trivial and binding. <laughs> Neither of these phases is trivial. They are both topological, but they are topologically distinct. Okay. So, so both of them have a topological edge mode, uh, but in this phase, which we happen to call trivial, it's load less on the right, and in this phase, it's load less on the left. Yeah, uh, but but then you're saying the trivial non-Hermitian guy has a churn number. Is that it, or or what, or or has some um, has something that is that has some topological invariant? You actually it does, right? Because it even exists at zero driving, where it's Hermitian. So on this Hermitian line of zero epsilon, uh, you can define a uh, like a normal Hermitian topological invariant. Uh -huh. In this case, it's in Zach phase. It doesn't matter. It's like a churn number for one B system. Uh, and, and indeed, then it's, um, well, <laughs> again, people would then say that you have a trivial and a non-trivial phase, but really there are just, again, two permission topological phases also here, which are distinct, and which have a mode either on the right or on the left. Okay. Actually, it's, it's kind of important, yeah, it, it's a whole different discussion, but maybe I'll mention it anyway, since you brought it up. Yeah. So this model is so on the line epsilon is zero here. The model is the SSH chain, right? Which is one of the sort of archetype topological models that people always look at. Mm -hmm. The special thing about the model that we have here, or the thing that we implement in reality, is maybe you can see it here. If you map this SSH model onto the Kane-Lubensky chain, then actually these blue sides they get mapped onto the uh, the masses, and the red sides get mapped onto the springs. So to make this thing. I will always have one more mass than I have springs because I need to connect my springs to something, right? Mm -hmm. So in this map, with this classical thing, I can only describe odd SSH chain with an odd number of sites in it, not even. Um, and the, the, the weird thing about the odd SSH chain is that it always has an edge state, either on the left or on the right. So if you look at the bulk, of course, you, you don't know about that because the bulk doesn't know about the edges. So if you look at the bulk invariant, it is still zero or one, and zero we traditionally call the trivial phase. Mm -hmm. But for an odd number of sites, even the trivial phase has an edge mode. I see. So yeah, really, we shouldn't call anything trivial. Things are just topologically distinct or not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing is trivial. Okay. Any more questions about this part before I move on to the next? No? All right, then let's move on because there's actually uh, much more interesting stuff going on in non hermitian things. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is really the, the core topic of this talk. It's the non hermitian split skin effect. I'll define what it is in a second. So first, the non hermitian skin effect, which is uh, also a fairly new topic, uh, but, but known already for a few years. Uh, what it means really is it's a very simple observation that if you have a non hermitian system and you describe it with periodic boundary conditions, then as we just said, right, it's, it's spectrum, its energies are in general complex. So for example, for a simple one dimensional chain here, not SSH, really simple without any topology in it, you can look at the spectrum and it could, for example, be a circle, right? So these green dots. But then if I open the chain by changing periodic boundary conditions to like open boundary conditions, the entire spectrum changes. All of these complex energies collapse onto the real line or the imaginary line actually depends on the system. Um, and, and, uh, and the spectrum completely changes. Uh, this is very different from anything that you've seen in Hermitian systems. Right? In Hermitian systems, if you change the boundary conditions, you change one side out of infinitely many, almost nothing happens typically, right? Maybe something happens with topological edge states, you either create them or not. Uh, but certainly not all of the bulk modes do something. So in non hermitian systems, that is not the case. It's possible there that the entire spectrum reorganizes. And this not only has an effect on the energies, actually, you can also see it in real space. So if you look at the wave functions or the modes of this non hermitian chain, then the non hermitian chain with open boundary conditions only has exponentially localized wave functions or functions modes. So all of the modes become H modes. 
there's not just one or two and then a bunch of insulating bullet modes. No, almost the entire system becomes an edge mode. Right? And so this, this complete localization of all of the modes coincides with this sort of really strong reorganization of the entire spectrum. Um, and actually, the nice thing is you can see this non-emission skin effect. And one of the first real observations in any real material was again done by the group of Grandin, uh, actually together with Aidan and, and Martin and Sander, uh, a couple of years ago already. And it's a nice movie, so I'll show it to you. Uh, I think we will only look at like the very few first seconds of this movie, though. Let's see. So what we get first is there are two chains here, and there's going to be a pulse. Perhaps you saw it propagate from left to right. Uh, and then it's going to propagate from right to left as well. Oh, sorry, that was a bit fast. Let me go back. So yeah, here you can see it, right? You can see the mode propagating from left to right or from right to left, and it does so in the same way. So this is a Hermitian system where everything from left to right happens the same way as from right to left. So now we make it non-Hermitian, actually making it non-reciprocal, the same way with these motors that apply a torque as before. And then what you will see is a completely different effect. There we go. Now there's, yeah, you see this thing propagates all the way to the end. Whereas this thing, here it's coming. There, it doesn't go anywhere. So you see by changing into a non-reciprocal or non-emission uh, system, you now have a, uh, a system in which modes propagate in one way. They only go in one direction. And this is precisely because all of the modes look uh, like they do here, right? They all propagate into one direction and not the other. Unfortunately, I've chosen to get the amplification on the left, whereas in the movie it's on the right, but it's the same idea, right? They, they go in one direction only. So if you excite the system on this side, you will, you know, the small excitation will have a big effect on this side, whereas if you do something on this side, it will damp. All right. Um, and so the question is, um, um, right, so, so that is the skin effect. And then the question is, is that all there is to it, or could there be more? So actually, it turns out, we found out that, uh, so this is the unpublished bit, uh, actually there is more. You can also make systems if you make a little bit, your system a bit more fancy, so not just this one dimensional chain, but now you add next nearest neighbor interactions and you make it non-emission by making non-emission spring, so non-reciprocal springs here, but also here. Then you can get spectrums that kind of looks like this. So it's, it looks a bit like a fish, right? Uh, and the nice thing about this fish is, uh, so. The, the green is again the bulk modes if I apply periodic boundary conditions. So I connect this thing to that thing. Then you get this green spectrum. And if I open up the boundary conditions, like I've drawn it here, then it all collapses onto, uh, onto like, localized states again. So onto these and these. Um, uh, so it's again, it's a massive reorganization of the entire spectrum and everything changes. But there's a crucial difference now between the blue and the red modes. And so mathematically, you can see it quite easily by looking at the bulk spectrum. So if you look at a blue mode, it is surrounded by a green line that, for example, propag or rotates counterclockwise around it. But all the red points have, have a green line that propagates clockwise around it. Right? So there's a different direction of winding around each of these points. Now, this simple mathematical observation actually has a physical effect. So if I look at the wave functions belonging to these blue points, these blue energies, they look like this, just like the, the localized bulk modes that we had before. But if I look at the red points, uh, then actually they look like this. Sorry, you should not have seen this picture yet. So <laughs> for this one, right, all of the blue modes are, are also blue here, and the red modes are also red here. And you see all of the blue ones are localized on the left, but the red ones are localized on the right. So the side of the system on which they localized seems to be determined by how the bulk spectrum winds around it. And you can actually play with like the ratio of nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor couplings and deform the spectrum into many other ways. So another fish that you can make is this one. It's a bit more complicated. But if you follow the green line, uh, then actually you see that it always winds clockwise around any point in this open spectrum. And so if I plot the wave functions for all of these points, then actually they're all blue. They're all localized on the left. So this, this really shows, right, it's the winding direction of the bulk spectrum with periodic boundary conditions that determines the localization 
of the open spectrum with open boundary conditions. So it's again, it's a uh, it's a periodic boundary conditions to open boundary conditions correspondence, but it's not a bulk edge correspondence because it's actually about all of the modes in the entire bulk. All of them change when you open the boundary condition. Okay, so this is uh, what we call the split skin effect. I mean, okay, for obvious reasons, right? Because the spectrum is actually split between left and right, and you can make this split by uh, making a split in the periodic spectrum. But notice this is different from before, right? There's only one band, one energy. So there's not two energies winding around each other. There's just one that does its own thing, makes a fish. Okay. So it's, it's not quite the null emission topology that I had before, but actually it smells a lot like topology, right? Because it has to do with the winding number and it creates a sort of correspondence between closed and open boundary condition. So that, that has all the signatures of topology. And actually, there is topology hidden in this system. But to get it out, you need to do a trick. So this system here is described by the Hamiltonian H. And now for each of the eigenvalues with open boundary conditions, I can create a new Hamiltonian by taking the value of that uh, energy, that's lambda, and then creating this bigger matrix. And by construction, this matrix is Hermitian, right? because this is the Hermitian plane to get it out. Um, also, by construction, this matrix always has a mode at zero energy because I've subtracted this lambda and I know that this has a mode uh, with energy lambda. So this always has a zero energy mode and it's Hermitian. So I can think of it like a normal Hermitian system with a topological zero mode. And then actually what you see is that if you now look at this Hamiltonian as a family of Hamiltonians, like with some parameter lambda that I can vary, then if I vary lambda along this line going from red to blue, you, you trace out precisely this spectrum. So there is this red mode, which is localized on the right, that turns into a blue mode, localized on the left, exactly as you go here from red to blue. Of course, that had to be the case, right? I put it in by construction. But the nice thing is that you see exactly where this happened, all of the other modes in this new Hamiltonian that I define uh, actually reach zero energy. So there is a gap closing. And in Hermitian systems, a gap closing is precisely the signature of the topological phase transition. So in this bigger Hermitian Hamiltonian, there is a topological phase transition, which shows you where the modes change localization. So you can think of this non-emission split skin effect as topology in a virtual dimension. Right? This lambda dimension doesn't really exist. You don't really have a family of Hamiltonians and you don't really have these green modes, but they are sort of virtually there because I can construct them out of this system. Uh, and then in this virtual dimension, this actually is uh, a whole family of Hamiltonians with a topological phase transition in it. Okay, so the conclusion of part two is that we can observe bulk skin mode localization, and that actually this localization and change of localization is controlled still by topology, but not topology in the system itself, but more topology in a related uh, system, like a sister system, which has an extra virtual dimension. So, so that, that virtual dimension was the eigenvalue? Was that? Was yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, by, sorry, by constructing this Hamiltonian, right? Uh, so, this Hamiltonian shares exactly one eigenmode with, the, with this system. Then we only the eigenmode uh, with eigenvalue lambda. All of the other eigenmodes are completely different. So, so in its spectrum, right, this mode is the same. So these modes, the red and the blue ones, are precisely these red and blue modes. But all of these others are different. Uh, they're just made up. They don't exist. So how, changing how, that. how did you come up with this one? <laughs> well, we have a very talented master student who is <laughs> very creative. <laughs> so that works. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, can, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, I mean, looking at all these diagrams in the complex plane, I cannot uh, stop thinking about uh, uh, complex variable in general, yeah. which I guess, I mean, of course it must be related, but uh, I, just, I, I guess you haven't done the, or at least I haven't noticed that you said something explicitly about it. So, I mean, in the complex plane, if you have any integral in the complex plane of a closed loop, mm -hmm. that integral is gonna be equal to the, the integral of each of the singularities that is enclosing. Yes, the singularity will be exactly like your donut holes uh, of your system. 
So, uh, so it would be, uh, I guess that that would be kind of the topology. So when you say topology in the virtual dimension, do you just mean topology in the complex plane in the sense that you have these singularities or is it? Uh, oh, so actually in this spectrum, there are no singularities. There are no singularities at all. So, so the topology is not in the complex, the, 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 this donut hole is not in the complex plane. No, not in this. You really have to make the system bigger and include the topology as extra. Okay. But the topology that you mentioned does exist. So in the earlier discussion of two winding eigenvalues, uh, there you can you can definitely there is an exceptional point in the middle that you're encircling. So there there is a donut hole that you can define if you want in the complex plane. Uh, but here with just a single band that uh, that doesn't exist. I so then so then so then I, I cannot think of this in the same term that I can think of integrals in the complex plane and then these closed loops. So what what you can do is make an integral of the complex plane around any fixed reference point. And then this integral will tell you whether the green line is winding clockwise or counterclockwise. So that, right. that, and that tells you whether the, the mode is localized on the left or the right. So, so that is certainly something you can do. But, but that's not really topological, since I can change parameters in my Hamiltonian, uh, which shift this crossing point all the way over here or all the way over here, making either everything red or blue, without closing any gaps or going through any non-smooth you know, non point. So I can smoothly deform all the red points and blue points and blue into red if I just look at this system. But the blue points at the moment in, in this particular setting are not singularities. They're not singularities, no. Okay. No. So thanks. This point, right, the crossing here, becomes a singularity of a bigger distance. But, but over here, it doesn't mean anything yet because it's just a projection. So they don't really sit on top of each other. Any more questions about this? So this this diagram uh, on the left top is a uh, is a diagram describing the energies of both a closed and an open system. Or am I wrong yeah, to yeah. do that? The so, the closed system and then both are the open system. Right, and so this super Hamiltonian yeah. describes both systems at the same time. Can you say that? No, or no, it describes the open system because the, the lambda here is the eigenvalue of the open system. Right, okay. Okay, so these green energy levels that we see, they're not ah, yeah, a they're part not of this Hamilton. Energy. Sorry, no, I should have chosen okay. the color. I just okay. realized that. I see, okay, 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 no, I understand. Thanks. Yeah, good that you point that out. I'll change that in a minute. Okay. Would there be any intuition as to why this this happens? That like all the eigenvalues, uh, which are initially like winding in the in the periodic boundary case, why it all like uh, becomes real in the in the open case? Um. Um. Uh, yes. Um. Because if you have an imaginary part in the energy, then it's being amplified over time, right? Uh, yeah. if, you have, if you have an open chain, uh, that would mean that you get a vibration that really destroys one of the sides. That there's nothing going around, but it's it's all accumulating on the side and, and amplifying. So you start to really amplify one of the sides, and it becomes unstable. So actually, stable modes in the open chain automatically become standing waves with real energy, or uh, pairs of complex energies. You see, you can make linear combinations of these two, which are still real. Ah, okay. Thank you. Okay, so to wrap it up, there's the big finale, and that is to combine parts one and two. So this is going to be very short, but, uh, but anyway, it's important. So what we've talked about already is non-emission topology, the binding of eigenvalues, and now and the bulk edge correspondence there. And then now I've also shown you a new sort of bulk edge correspondence, or actually bulk bulk correspondence uh, for these non-emission systems without topology. So what happens if we combine them? Right? What if we have non-emission topology and the split skin effect? So actually, it turns out that we can make yet another SSH-like chain, which is different from the two that we showed before, uh, which has both of these effects in it. So this has different masses and different springs. Uh, and if you look at this system, it actually has four bands. So here, sorry for the change of colors, but uh, purple are the, uh, the energies of the system with closed boundary conditions, periodic. And then the dots are for open boundary conditions. Let's look at only at the top left. So then what you see for the for the bulk system, it just has four bands, right? Four loops. And then if you go to the open system, it has dots inside, like you would expect. Uh, but it also has 
two dots and here another two in the gaps. So these modes are skin effect modes. They are the bulk modes that become exponentially amplified to the side because of the skin effect that we just described. These modes are topological modes. So they sit here in the gap because the system itself has a topological topology. It has these binding eigenvalues. They don't sit at zero energy because of the way the system happened to be constructed. You can think of them as just displaced from zero energy and they sit in the gap between these two maps. Now you can change one of the parameters in the model and deform this spectrum so that these circles slowly become bigger and these things start to move away from each other. And the topologic edge modes actually go into the circle and eventually these two circles touch each other and recombine. So this touching of circles is precisely the same as what we saw before in our very first model, right? Where two bands that are separate touch and begin winding around one another. So this here is a topological phase transition. Where here there is no winding number of energies in, in the, the periodic system, right? And here in the periodic system, these two energies wind around each other. So. But now if you look at these edge modes, the red modes in real space, and you look where they are localized, then actually you will notice that here they relocate from left to right as soon as they move into the bulk spectrum and not when you have this topological phase transition. So this relocation of the, of the topological modes is actually controlled by the skin effect and not by the topological bulk edge correspondence. Uh, now of course, at this point, you should all start protesting because if, if this is not controlled by topology, then what happened in our first system? Did I not try to show you that we did have a bulk edge, bulk edge correspondence? Uh, so actually, it turns out that you know by coincidence, we happen to look at a very special system here. So if I draw the same series of diagrams, if you look at the bulk spectrum here and the uh, open spectrum are the dots, and here is the topological edge mode that we were looking at, and here in the, the, the bottom sort of phase, right, we have two separate bands which don't wind around each other, and the topological mode sitting in the middle. But because of the symmetries of the system, this topological mode never moves. And the only thing that happens is that these two, two circles touch each other and then combine into a big circle. But the moment where they touch and where there's a topological phase transition is also necessarily the moment where the red dot goes into the circle. So actually the skin effect and the topological effect coincide in this system and you cannot separate them from one another. So actually what we were, okay, if you compare it to this system, what we've now shown is that the bulk edge correspondence that we thought we saw uh, is actually not quite the bulk edge correspondence controlled by the topology of these binding eigenvalues. It is really controlled by just the skin effect or the fit skin effect and the mode going into the bulk spectrum and changing its binding. So, uh, there is a bit which is so new that I haven't even introduced it in this presentation which is that we can probably actually disentangle these two effects and also look at a quantity which shows you how the, uh, so sorry, I should show it in this diagram. There is probably, but we're still working on this, a quantity that shows you uh, where the topological localization changes and which is separate from where the skin effect localization changes. So we can probably disentangle these two effects, but that is what we are working on right now. So if you want details, I'm happy to tell you, but I haven't included it here. So, but the conclusion so far is that topological edge modes in, in non-Hermitian systems are actually subject to both the split skin effect and the bulk edge correspondence. And to see where they are localized, you, you, you cannot do with either just one of those, you actually need both. You need to know about the topology and about the skin effect. So there's a bulk edge correspondence for the topology and a bulk bulk correspondence for the, the skin effect. And you need to know about both. All right, that's what I wanted to tell you. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, Mark. I have a very quick question about the last diagram you showed. What is the parameter that uh, that changes throughout uh, the four panels? That uh, is it the activity or the, the, the yeah. epsilon? Yeah. Okay, the epsilon basically. All right. Yeah. Okay. That controls everything. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I have a question about nomenclature. So you call it bulk bulk. Uh, mm -hmm. 
so, but but I mean, uh, you you went into this higher dimensional space in which things look like bulk edge kind of thing, right? Or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I mean with that is really uh, so. Let me just go back. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, okay, maybe it's not the best name, but what I, what I mean with bulk gold correspondence is that there is a property of the system with periodic boundary conditions which tells you about the localization of modes with open boundary conditions, but, but not about edge modes in yeah, the open system, it's, it's about all of the modes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I understand, yeah, yeah. But then when you look at it, you look at kind of bulk edge in a higher dimensional space. Yes, yeah, so, so to see that actually this correspondence, this bulk bulk or open closed correspondence is in some way topological, you go into a higher dimension where it's a bulk edge correspondence. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, okay. That's confusing. Yeah. On the system itself, you don't see it, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so really what I'm saying, right, is that, you know, nature that we are looking at uh, actually looks like it is the edge of the political system that we, we can't see. Yeah, so, so yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah it's maybe another way to think about emergence again. So, so there's no weird way in which you could sort of visualize in some way or, or excite oh. these bulk modes in this green stuff. Uh, we can, of course, but not in this system. Then you have to make an implementation of this system. Right, right. Which is also perfectly possible. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. This would be like two chains, right? I guess. Two uh, chains yeah. uh, connected. Uh... Two dimensional, even, not just two chains, but two whole dimensions. And there's a continuous spectrum here. Maybe you said it, but the choice of boundary condition mm -hmm. uh, enters precise technically where does it enter and how sensitive is everything to the choice of boundary condition? So, in, uh, ah, my mouse is doing really weird things today. Sorry. So, in, in this diagram, this, this fish diagram, the choice of boundary conditions is precisely the difference between the, the green line, which is the boundary conditions, and the dots, which are open boundary conditions. So everything, so the point of the skin effect is that it's like uh, super sensitivity to boundary conditions, making an open change changes the entire spectrum completely and also all of the eigenfunctions. But can you uh, uh, not tune the boundary conditions somehow? Like this is a choice yeah. boundary condition. And my question was how, how sensitive is it to the precise nature of the boundary condition? Yeah, so yeah, oh, yes, no, good point. It's super sensitive. So as soon as you go from uh, from periodic boundary conditions to something a bit less than periodic, but not quite open, the whole thing collapses. Uh, what you can do also is look at a half infinite chain, right? So you have something like closed boundary conditions on one side and something like open on the other side, and then actually this whole thing fills in. And you have all of the modes also connecting the, the bulk spectrum to the open spectrum. But that's of course something we can never realize in, in reality because you can't make half infinite systems. So as you if you turn on some continuous parameter that interpolates between open and periodic. Yeah. Then there's actually a phase transition at zero. Where if, as soon there's as you, a phase, yeah, right. Uh, precisely at the periodic point, somehow there is yeah. a special uh, phase yeah. transition. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And and the uh, what's the order? Is that topological or does that have an order parameter? What what's the um, that's a good question. I know people have looked into this in Japan, I believe, but I forget exactly how it works. I would have to look that up. Sorry. Okay, thanks. I believe that if I recall correctly, that there is a, you know, you could count the number of, uh, of modes, of, uh, of way of times the modes are degenerate when they're localized and related to how many times the fish or the, the fish plot winds, right? Because now it shows it, it winds wise, uh, once or twice or three times. But I think we can only observe it one mode uh, because of the specific uh, specifics of boundary conditions we use, I, I recall, right? But if we were to be able to tune the boundary conditions such that this extra mode would be compatible <laughs> with this, this, the boundary condition would be compatible with, this with these modes, we would in principle be, be able to relate the number of times this fish plot winds to the to the number of the, of these edge modes, right? Am I correct, Jasper? Yeah, that's correct. And again, there's a phase condition at exactly the point where you start. Yeah. 
So some, sometimes some boundary condition seems to be frustrating, so, so frustrating some, some of the modes, I guess. But I guess uh, that can complete a bit the answer to Jan, I think. Yeah. Now, the thing about it, Jan, I, I think the phase resolution has to be first order because you really make a, a, a discrete change to the system. Yeah, yeah. So there's no like interesting scale invariance emerging at the uh, exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? It doesn't look like. Okay. So let's thanks Jasper again. Thanks a lot.